Welcome to Wonderlust. The American bison, the animal whose ancient history and near extinction we've covered in parts one and two of this series, is, despite the odds, one of the great conservation success stories of United States wildlife. While there are numerous animals living in private and public herds, which I will cover in the fourth and final episode of this series, their outlook and survival was once much more precarious. While some bison were rescued from the slaughter of the mid-1800s and taken into private hands, which we'll discuss later in this episode, Yellowstone National Park was the last place in the United States where free-roaming plains bison never disappeared and is where we begin our journey. Though now visited by millions of people a year, the protection of Yellowstone was not always certain. To understand how its wildlife were preserved, we first go back to the park's Pelican Valley, just after a powerful March snowstorm in 1894. For several weeks, a group of soldiers were on the trail of a notorious bison poacher, Edgar Howell, known to be armed and willing to kill. One day, when following fresh tracks in the snow, Two of the soldiers heard a series of gunshots and followed the sounds to see Howell busy skinning five freshly killed bison. Though 400 yards away and armed with only a single pistol between the pair, they quietly moved in on him while he was engrossed in his work and removed his rifle, leaned against a tree before he could grab it and shoot them. With no way to escape, threatening to kill his dog for not barking in warning, the soldiers arrested him. However, despite the arrest, they had a problem. Poachers could be captured, but could only be escorted out of the park and would face no jail time or fines. Since its creation, legal protection was blocked by lobbying work done by the mining industry, who had hopes that the park's protections would be weakened and railroads built within. As luck would have it, a group of reporters for Forest and Stream were in the park on the day of the arrest. The park superintendent, who had long fought for legal protection, saw the killing as an opportunity to spur public outcry against poaching in the park, and at long last, create legislation to protect it for us all. Working with Forest and Stream and their contacts in Washington, they ran articles about the case, demanding legal backing for the park's protected status. The fervor the photographs of the killed bison created in the public forced Congress to act, and within two months, legislation was implemented to end a two-decade fight for protection. And, in a fitting turn, the first arrest made under the new laws for entering the park without permission, despite an order against it, was Edgar Howell. However, the poaching battle would leave a deep scar for many years after. By the early 1900s, just over 20 bison remained in the park, and it became apparent that outside help was needed to avoid a total population collapse. And this is where we change our focus, from the bison on public lands to the privately owned bison and their role in saving the species. During the peak of the bison slaughter, when it seemed that all would be lost, a marriage of business and compassion combined to bring in some of the bison from the storms of gunfire into private sanctuary. One of these sanctuaries was found in a Texas canyon 1,500 feet deep, 10 miles wide, and nearly 100 miles long. In this canyon, sweeping a dusty wooden porch in the scorching sun, stood a short, dark-haired woman named Molly, or Mary Ann Goodnight. A glance into her eyes revealed her tremendous strength and heart. Being the lone woman in this rugged and unforgiving place, she was known to the workers of the ranch and others who passed through as the mother of the panhandle, despite her lack of children. As her three pet chickens clucked and pecked at stray seeds, she heard gunshot after gunshot as bison were slaughtered to make way for her ranch's cattle. In her diary, she wrote of hearing the blasts of gunfire in the day and the wailing of calves in the night. These brutal scenes inspired her to action, and with a deep love for the animals, she convinced her husband, Charles Goodnight, to capture several calves and raise a herd on their ranch lands. While Charles experimented with crossing bison with cattle, making what he called cattalo, the pair would come to own some of the last purebred members of the southern bison. A small number of other herds were scattered through the United States, including a herd on the Flathead Reservation in western Montana, 
purchased by Michael Pablo and Charles Allard, and a sizable herd owned by Charles Jesse Jones, often nicknamed Buffalo Jones. And while these private ranchers developed their herds with varying levels of cattle genes, a zoologist working for what is now the Smithsonian Museum was sent to collect bison carcasses to immortalize the animal's appearance as its remains, they thought, would be banished to memory. William Hornaday, in addition to shooting several bison for the planned museum exhibit, brought back several live bison in an attempt to create a herd at what is now the Smithsonian Zoological Park. These bison would grow in number over the years and helped inspire the creation of the American Bison Society, co-founded by Theodore Roosevelt, which helped reintroduce bison to public lands throughout the United States. With the laws in place to protect the Yellowstone bison, park officials knew that they would need to supplement the remaining bison herd from private hands. In 1902, 18 cows from the Pablo Allard herd and three bulls from the Goodnight herd were sent to Yellowstone National Park to form the Lamar Buffalo Ranch. Bison raised on the ranch were periodically released into the park to breed with the remaining wild bison. And from these releases, the park's bison population grew to the several thousand animals living in the park today. Around the same time as the Yellowstone release, Hornaday, recently hired by the Wildlife Conservation Society, then the New York Zoological Society, acquired bison for the Bronx Zoo from the Smithsonian Zoological Park and Buffalo Jones, and with the help of the American Bison Society, along with funding from Congress, shipped 15 bison by train to Cache, Oklahoma. Their arrival was met by enormous fanfare, including a visit from the famed Comanche chief Quana Parker, who before displacement considered their reintroduction zone his homeland. From there, the bison were placed in large crates and loaded into wagons, which were opened to the nearby Wichita Mountains. These 15 bison would form the basis of the 650 free-ranging bison roaming the wildlife refuge today. Other free-roaming herds include those in Custer State Park, South Dakota, the National Bison Range Herd in Montana, Utah's Antelope Island Herd, and the 150 animals in Caprock State Park, Texas, descended by those saved by the Good Knights. In the next and final video of the Ghosts of the Prairie series, we examine the bison's place in the modern world. From private ranches to public herds, hundreds of thousands of bison live in the United States today and are the source of much fascination and controversy. From their influence on ecotourism-driven economies to perceived threats to cattle ranching, to reunification with Plains native tribes, the bison's existence is every bit as complex as the societies that surround it. And that complexity, for good or for bad, will be our focus when we next meet. Until then, wander in wonder.